joined us. This is my 10th year of doing this particular session here at CES. And there's two pieces of criteria um, that I try to build into the show, into this session. Um, one, I'm asked to look forward to what kind of technologies that I see that might be disruptive over the next 12 to 18, 24 months. Um, we could obviously delve into disruptive things that would be five, 10 years out, but we've always tried to keep it relatively short term. Secondly, when we look at this, this entire issue of disruptive, um, I'm in a unique position as an industry analyst in that I get to see stuff in the labs way before they get to market. And I actually spend a lot of time looking on at technologies behind the scenes. Um, as a result, it puts me in a little bit of a quandary in that um, when I do the session, they give me one hour. <laughs> and I've got to figure out what I can put into an hour to give the best we can. And the problem with that is I have to choose who to bring in each year from many. And uh, it's been interesting year in that I've seen so many great things. But today I'm going to showcase three or four things that I, re I really want to focus on that I think you're going to be quite interested in that I consider really disruptive in the next couple of years. Um, the other thing about this particular session is the folks at CES asked us if we would also include a bit of a gaming twist to give you an understanding because gaming, as you know, has become an incredible part of, uh, of uh, basically the way our, our digital fabric. I'm always surprised when I'm standing in line and I'm looking at people with their cell phones or their tablets that how many are actually playing games as opposed to email these days. And whether it be handheld games to video games, there's an immense amount of activity going into that space. So with that in mind, uh, one of the first things, uh, individuals I'm going to introduce to you is Jim Clappen, who's the president of Corning, the Corning's Glass Division. Most of you know Corning Glass for the Gorilla Glass. But I happened to be at their, uh, I was invited to their headquarters in Corning last spring and got a chance to, behind the scenes, see some really interesting things. And I, I am really convinced, two, two things. Number one, you and I are going to have a lot of screens in our digital lifestyle. Smartphones, tablets, smart watches, the whole thing. But, but as a result, what I am really intrigued with is what those screens are going to be. And Corning has been doing incredible work behind the scenes to make these next generation screens not only brighter, more durable, but flexible and doing a lot of interesting things. So with that in mind, Jim, do you join us? Thanks, Tim, and thanks for having me on this panel. Well, good morning, everyone. Please take a moment to note that some of what I will say and show you today is forward-looking. Got to do this for the IR guys. So some of you might be asking yourself, what's a glassmaker doing on this panel? So I'd like to tell you some things you may not know about glass, its properties, what it does, and what it can do in the future. In the past, glass was primarily the host for electronic components that made up an LCD display for gaming, for watching sports, or for a business-related video conference. That was then, but this is now. Today, glass is integral, even critical, to the form, function, and features of displays and their devices. Take a look at the major trends in displays today. The LCD industry is moving towards ultra-high resolution which is measured in pixels per inch. So the drive to higher resolution means increasing the number of pixels on a display. Naturally, the smaller the screen, the smaller the pixels. Today, some smartphones pack more than 300 pixels per inch in the display. And the trend is towards even more and greater pixel density. For televisions today, 60-inch high-definition TV has roughly 37 pixels per inch. 
a 4K ultra high definition TV, now being commercialized this year, has 73 pixels per inch. And the even higher resolution 8K version has about 147 pixels per inch. Again, the trend is moving towards more pixels and thus higher resolution. In addition to increasing resolution with brighter colors and deeper blacks, displays of all sizes evoke an emotional response from the viewer. And believe it or not, glass matters here. And what that glass composition is and how it's produced also matters. Corning's display glass is fusion formed, which results in glass that is virtually flawless. Why is this important? Imagine finding the equivalent of a head of a pin on a football field. Translating that scale to finding a speck or an inclusion on the display glass substrate is enough to disrupt sophisticated LCD microelectronics and cause pixel failures. Our fusion form glass is created in air and we maintain that pristine surface all the way to our customers, the display panel makers. In fact, in terms of cleanliness and surface attributes, the glass substrate is much closer to a large silicon wafer than it is to ordinary glass. Its surface is super smooth, dimensionally very flat, and with very tight specifications for thickness variation across the entire sheet. And it is formulated to remain dimensionally stable through the most demanding and high temperature processes that our customers put it through. This glass substrate can then host each of those tiny pixels that provide the amazing color and contrast we both expect and demand. High technology glass is also important in touch and gesture control, both of which are becoming more and more common. Incel touch is an emerging technology. It has the potential to reduce manufacturing cost and it enables thinner, and lighter devices. The substrate, which hosts the TFT array, must not interfere with the precision touch experience, even as it now doubles as a touch sensor glass. So that is the role of the glass substrate inside the display, making it work. Glass also has an important role on the outside. Displays continue to get larger, while the devices themselves are getting slimmer. This is true from the mobile space all the way up to wall size screens. Add to that the growing trend of touch and portability, and you see why Corning's Gorilla Glass becomes a necessity. It's so thin and optically clear that it reduces parallax, or refraction, to nearly zero. If you stop by the Corning booth in the central hall, you can see it in action on an 82-inch multi-touch screen. Optically clear and tough Gorilla Glass also allows a platform for something very new and different. Something especially exciting for creating an immersive gaming experience. This is something our researchers are working on now. We've tiled together three 42 inch panels and by obscuring the bezels through some tricky optics integrated on a Gorilla Cover Glass, we've created a device which provides for a more immersive viewing experience. Imagine gaming in a seamless, panoramic, virtual world. Real life is immersive. Things happen behind you, to your side, and at the edge of your peripheral vision. You are not just seeing things here, but everywhere. This is an advancement for gaming, and we'll see for other opportunities as well. Optically pure, high-performance glass can make this possible. Take Corning's high-technology glass and combine it with optical and other functionality emerging from our labs, and the future, indeed, appears quite bright. But this is also just the beginning. Imagine if you didn't need to tile. Imagine if the display could conform to its environment rather than the other way around. Imagine if a highly specialized glass could bend. This is ultra slim, flexible glass we call Corning Willow Glass. And many of the advances in display we are talking about are going to depend 
on willow. It is thinner than a sheet of copy paper, yet with all the properties of Corning's leading LCD glass substrate, which means that this is possible. That's a clip of a longer video, which, if you haven't seen it before, can be found on YouTube. What you just watched, that's the future. A future where displays are everywhere. A revolutionary new manufacturing platform is just starting to emerge through collaboration with industry-leading researchers. The process known as roll-to-roll -roll will allow you to print electronics on flexible glass just like you print ink onto newspaper. That can mean cheaper, multifunction displays featuring ultra-high resolution, saturated color, and integrated touch. There's a future where immersion in an audiovisual experience brings value well beyond gaming and entertainment. As the artificial barrier between device and user shrinks, displays become even more viable and critical in education and commerce. This future is also where electronic information is no longer constrained to two dimensions, but where you are literally in the center of the action. You're not just playing a game or video chatting with a friend, a colleague, or family member anymore. You are in the game. You are talking to someone who is right here in front of you, just as you saw that hospital scene in the clip. Beyond all of this, beyond a combination of incredibly lifelike displays feather light touch capability, and the immersive experience, glass can do one more absolutely critical thing. Glass optical fiber can make sure the transfer of information is lightning fast so that there's no latency or lag or distortion of what you're seeing on the screen. Much of the data transfer we now take for granted is thanks to glass optical fiber, fiber to the cell tower and fiber to the home. The internet, the mobile downloading, and the real-time interactive communication is all thanks, in a large part, to glass optical fiber. In 1970, Corning invented the world's first low-loss optical fiber and nurtured this new technology through the 80s and the 90s. And just yesterday, Corning introduced two new optical cables for consumer use, a new USB and a new Thunderbolt cable. At 10 gigabits per second, the Thunderbolt is twice as fast as the new USB 3. The new optical Thunderbolt and USB versions by Corning are also 80% lighter, 50% smaller in diameter, and can be used in lanes 10 times longer than copper cables. So that's what we're doing today with Glass Science at Corning, helping to enable a high resolution, ultra high resolution displays, the touch screens, and delivering the high-speed optical fiber and cable at the core of today's virtual world. Together, this means crystal clear picture quality, an immersive experience, and a speed of action on a display that is unprecedented. 
That's great for gaming, but it's also just bringing the world a little closer together. To see more of what we do, please visit our booth. It's in Central Hall right across from the folks at Sony. Just look for the three 30-foot tall gorillas and bring bananas. Thank you. <laughs>
um, demos uh, and uh, put into perspective not only what they can do with gaming, but in all kind of things, whether it be e-commerce, museums, etc. Casper? Thanks, Tim, uh, and hello, everyone. <laughs> Uh, yes, I mean, our focus at Zappa um, is really on AR-enabled products and entertainment experiences. Uh, there are many other applications for AR that are out there, from information-based search and other utilities, but, but we're focused really on the product-led entertainment side. And we're particularly interested in the intersection between a handheld device, um, be that mobile um, or, a, or a tablet, or indeed glasses in the future, and physical objects um, themselves. Um, and that's really about trying to unlock value within that space between them. And we define that value in terms of end user experience um, and indeed incremental revenue. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term AR, it stands for augmented reality. Um, it means the ability to enhance um, or manipulate your surroundings in real time, um, as in this example from a campaign that we ran for, for Green Lantern in, in the UK. So AR uses computer vision inputs, um, that's sound, video, graphics data, layered um, onto the real world through a device um, to give that added value experience, in this case, more about the movie. Um, now, AR itself actually has been around since the 60s. It's been around for a long time um, within universities. It's just that no one was really thinking about a mass market application for it. And it's only recently that it's migrated to um, mobile devices. So the challenge really now is to create a, a use case for AR that is compelling to, to brand owners uh, engaging for the mass market and can generate revenue. And that's really what we're trying to do here. We're trying to pioneer a mass market consumer application for AR on handheld devices. And we've also taken the liberty of, of trying to create a new consumer-friendly language around it, because AR is quite a clunky term. And the clue's in our name. It's an app using AR that lets you zap stuff. Um, but it's really not just about creating an app. It's trying to create a ubiquitous function um, for your device, inspiring everyday usage through a new way of discovering, indeed sharing, and, and personalizing content. So we try and think of it more as a, as a new lens for your device, a, a window onto a hidden, unlockable world um, surrounding us one zap at a time. And we really describe these experiences as, as bite-sized entertainment. They're, they're sort of small, they're snackable morsels that fit that mobile occasion that's often stolen or, or on the go. Uh, so they tend to be sort of 30-second hits, if you like. Um, and, and the only thing we try to do is make sure that it brings a smile to your face and really rewards you for the effort that you put in. Because it's got to give you something you couldn't get better or quicker, either just online or in a standard app. So at the heart of our mission, really, is a simple thought that life's more fun uh, when it's zapped. Okay. And we always start with the uh, consumer experience um, and kind of work back to the tech. Uh, we're lucky enough to have some very bright guys from the University of Cambridge who built the proprietary platform and, and came up with the algorithm. So, so the tech's pretty solid. Um, so what does this look like? So I'm going to try and uh, do a few demos uh, to show this. Let me click over to... The iPhone, let's see if this comes up. So here we are on the Zapper app. Um, and we're going to continue the, um, the movie theme. Uh, so here we are looking at a poster for Happy Feet. And as we look at it through the phone, Bill Eric comes alive, does his dance, what he does best. You can watch a trailer. And indeed, we can set Eric free. And we can bring him up here on stage and uh, we can take a photo with him that we can share with others. So, sort of as described, it's very sort of light um, entertainment experience, really. It's, it's no, no more than that, but a, a fun way to engage and get some other content out of a poster. Um, so another project that we work with, going from uh, print to publishing, was something we did with uh, the unstoppable uh, One Direction um, and Sony Music. Uh, and, and this was for a, a, a picture book that went with uh, a limited edition box set that you could get for the new album. Um, and when you opened it up in the camera view and went through it, there was a case of unlocking different content that exists within. So, and this is quite interesting because it basically represents a sort of treasure hunt, you know, as we go through the book, different videos, or indeed little sort of games that we can play. So, you know, the classic kind of slide puzzle that we can do uh, to move things around and get more pictures of Harry, which is what all the girls want. Um, when we move from publishing to then other product sectors, I mean, really what we're trying to do is find disruptive ways to add value to different sectors. Um, and one of the ones that we um, have recently worked on is, is actually uh, device cases. So uh, this was something that we did with the, the team at Fruit Ninja. Um, a game that 
some of you will be familiar with. But here, what's interesting is we can play with the space between the case uh, and the screen to bring a different flavor, if you like, to this game and a different way of kind of exploring that content. Again, very sort of light, um, but a nice different take on how that game works. Um, we started with a penguin. Um, we'll move on to a, a bunny. Um, this is our uh, little zapper mascot. Hi. How you doing? Obviously has a Brooklyn accent, as I imagine most bunnies do. Here you are. Uh, and here again, we can play a little simple game, which I hope he doesn't embarrass me with his tennis skills. Um, and again, an interaction between what we're seeing. And he can, he's not confined by that target, he can move away from it. And indeed, I can take him off here. He can come up on stage and play around and so on. At some point, he'll win. Um, so what about other product sectors? We, we do a lot of work in, in, in apparel, and I, I can't say that I necessarily suit a trucker's hat, but you just have to bear with me on this one. Um, now, this is, a, again, a different sort of challenge for us um, in that we're de dealing with curved surfaces and different sort of sublimation prints. Um, but in this example, oop, take that up. Um, we can create digital masks. Uh, and again, I can interact, uh, get my tongue out, and all sorts of things here. And I can take a little video of that as well, which I can then share with friends if I want. Um, again, very light, uh, uh, sort of little interactions uh, that just offer up a bit of fun. A final one I'll just show, um, which is again a, a different problem for us, which is how do you get more people zapping content? I should really take this off, shouldn't I? I look ridiculous. Um, uh, you know, it is how do we get more zaps into people's lives? You know, if you've got to go and find this content, what's an easy way to do it? And one of the things we thought about, well, what are those everyday triggers that people will use and how can we get people um, getting them on every street corner? So a different way of thinking about that was taking inventory that exists, a stop sign in this case, and then adding content to that. Um, and this was something we looked at with College Humor. And I, I don't have to keep that in view. I can then take that, sort of grab and go and take that Master content with, blocks, with us. Weaver. So just a, a few examples of, of, of what we can do then um, using a, a, the Zapper app. Um, I mean, there are so many more demos that we could really go through, but the bigger thought I really want to leave you with is this notion that everything has the potential to communicate. It can be that gateway um, to the secret life of things, um, revealing the stories and, and content within. And it's a bit like that, that wonderful scene in Pulp Fiction when Christopher Walken tells the story of the gold watch before he passes it on to the boy. So in the future, each object, like that watch, could have a, its own story waiting to be unlocked and explored. And, and, and this sort of tech demo that's going on in the background here is something that we were looking at for bracelet charms, very small, sparse targets, but how we could connect personal stories between a giver and receiver in that mold. Um, and this secret life of things creates a new product and, and indeed revenue opportunities for content owners and licensors with com compelling stories to tell. Uh, and we're lucky enough to be working with some of the biggest and best licenses in the world, uh, bringing that content and physical goods closer together um, in multimedia formats. So um, in apparel, we've produced around 200 t-shirts now, sold about 2 million around the world, because that the right products and content provides that global model that's scalable, and that can be replicated across other products. Where it gets more fascinating, and one of our visions for the future, is, is where we connect these dots between all the things that you zap. Whether it's a t-shirt, caps, books, puzzles, toys, tours, cereal boxes, whatever it might be, we can begin to game everything and reward people for their participation in zapping more stuff and sharing that content. So we can let them personalize, create, and distribute their own zaps within this new community. And then we have this very powerful platform that connects people to things and brands with consumers. Now, it's pretty early days in this journey, um, but we certainly think over the next two years, our hunch is that this area of visual search and image recognition can, can become as everyday an activity on devices to a growing group of consumers um, as the internet. So our goal is to ensure that more of the things around us are zappable uh, to inspire this new Generation Z. Thank you. Yeah, he came by my office and we were playing with the bunny and he had me dancing with the bunny on the desk. Um, as you can see, this is really fascinating. Now, this is the tip of the iceberg with augmented reality. Um, I had him show a bit uh, more focused on the gaming in this, in this session. 
But you know, they you can they're they're working with, for example, museums. So the you go to the museum and look at an exhibit, put your iPhone or tablet in front of it, and now all of the information about the the monkeys or whatever you're watching, seeing there is coming actually on your screen. The whole idea is to add, as I call it, data lay layering, bringing more data onto the screen in this reality mode. And it's really quite fascinating. Um, when we get to questions and answers, I, I want you to go into how you actually do this. But because of time, I want to move into the next company. How many of you have an Android phone or an Andro Android tablet? Quite a few of you. Oh, very good. You're going to like this one. Um, when I normally go looking for a uh, disruptive technology, you know, I, I usually either get it from the labs or I scan, see reports, and see things. And um, this one was really interesting because they just moved next door to my office. And I, I, I had heard a little bit about this company because one of my customers had told me about it. And I said, uh, I got to see this thing. And so one morning, I walked into my office. And I looked at the door of the, because the, I knew new tenants were coming in. And I looked at the door, and, and here was Bluestacks, the company that I wanted to see. So it made it quite easy to walk next door. And I said, well, can you show me what you're doing? And this is a company that is, is adding an incredible amount of uh, dimension to the application world in the context of being able to write once and deploy anywhere. So with that in mind, I'm going to introduce Rosen Sharma, who is a very well-known uh, entrepreneur, sold many, built and sold many companies. Um, and he is CEO of Bluestacks. Rosen? Thanks, Tim. Thanks for the opportunity of being here. So I have four girls. They're 10, 8, 7, and 1 year old. And my 10 year old says to me, Papa, you're finally doing something useful. <laughs> and that reflects how quickly you know, our world has changed. I mean, I came to the Valley in 1993. And if you go back to like uh, 2000, the, we were in this PC-centric world, right, where we were talking about how we can make our TV work with our PC, or we can make our, you know, everything in the house work with the PC. And now, if you look at our kids, or you look at somebody who's not yet 20, their world completely revolves around the phone, right? So we are in a phone-centric world. And I think that that shift has happened so suddenly over the last four or five years that it has um, you know, changed how we think, how we compute. And our, I mean, for most people in this room, our first computing device was a laptop right, or a PC. But for most of the kids today, their first computing device is a phone. And so how we think about you know, the um, yeah, how we think about the world and how we think about the software that is coming to these devices going forward is very phone-centric. So where we started at Bluestack says, hey, I have my phone. I love to play apps on it. And can I send apps from my phone to the PC? And we launched that. We call it App Player. And then Apu here, who runs all our business uh, side of things, is going to show you demos of it. Um, and you know the ability of doing what you're doing on the phone, whether it's apps or it's data or it's sensors, and being able to use that on any device in the house, starting with the PC, but the TV and other devices, is really at the heart of what we do. So I'll let Apu give you a demo here and show you more about you know, what we are doing. Hey, everyone. How are you doing? So I have the privilege of showing you some of the coolest new demos at CES this year. And I'm sure you'll like this stuff. So let's jump right into it. Uh, you've probably heard about everything we do. You've seen a lot of uh, news and media and press about Bluestacks in the past few days, in the past few months. But for those of you who are not uh, completely aware of uh, the cool things we do, we give you the ability to run all of your uh, mobile apps on Windows devices, Windows PCs, 
and Mac PCs. So that's just a fantastic way for you to be able to use your apps on any device. And what I have up here, I'm gonna lift it up just a little gingerly. So this shiny orange thing up here is one of the latest PCs that you've probably already seen uh, at CES. This is the Lenovo Yoga. Uh, it's a Ultrabook hybrid, does a lot of cool things. And it comes with BlueStacks on it. Uh, what you see up there on your screens is the BlueStacks app player. So the notion is that with the BlueStacks app player, you get the ability to run all of your Android apps on the device that you're running BlueStacks on. And in this case, uh, you get to see uh, the app categories at the top of your screen there. So you have the, the top app categories, you have the top 25 apps. You have really cool ways to search for apps. You can download any app you like. You can get into app stores. So essentially you have the full gamut of apps available to you now on your PC device or on your Mac, which is just fantastic. Uh, what I'll do is I'll jump into a couple of apps and show you how smooth and seamless this really is. So going back to my apps, here is the Pulse newsreader, everyone's favorite newsreader. It's trying to update itself in real time. And you will notice that the transitions are very smooth. The movements are very smooth. Now, this is the original Pulse app that you have on your Android phone already. And it's just running magically on a Windows PC without any change to the app whatsoever. So this is the original app running on a PC. And I'll show you something else, which is a very popular game in Asia, in China. This is uh, called Defender. Most of you are probably familiar with this and I've played this uh, on the flight into Vegas. Again, very smooth graphics, very smooth transitions. Now again, remember that this is an app that was designed and written for a mobile device. So that's the form factor for which this app was originally written for. And we are running this on a, on a PC, on a, on a large display device. We could run this on a TV that's up to 40, 50 inches, any of the new 85 inch devices and TVs that are demoed um, today and yesterday here at CES. And tons of iOS and Mac users in the room as well. So for you guys, and for the PC users, here's your favorite Flipboard. And yes, you can run Flipboard on your PC or your Mac. It's not just confined to your phones anymore. So some of the magical stuff that BlueStacks enables. OK, so let me jump into some of the, the absolute brand new stuff from BlueStacks that you may not have ever heard of or seen yet. Most of us who own smartphones um, use this on a day-to-day -day basis, hour-to-hour -hour basis, to, to check email, to get our SMS, to play games, to keep ourselves entertained. Our, our lives are on this device now. And we were wondering at BlueStacks that, okay, so if I'm receiving my SMS on this device, why shouldn't I also have the ability to receive my SMS on my PC? So why isn't my data also available to me on the PC or on the Mac. And if my apps are on this device, then is there a neat way to get my apps over, the same apps from my phone over to my PC? So we came up with a very cool, very cool new cloud service. And with this cloud service, we give you, the end user, we give you the ability to sync your SMS over to your PC and now you have the ability to receive SMS on this PC. So this is live, you're seeing messages that came in from my buddy John who's probably running around here taking pictures. And uh, here are some messages that came in a few minutes ago from Rosen while he was trying to uh, drive up to the convention center. And then bunches of messages. Uh, so this is the exact same set of text messages that I have on my HTC One X device here, on my smartphone here. And I can also send one right back to Rosen and it would just go out from my PC and to Rosen's phone. So this happens entirely from this device. Now, in addition to that, uh, our new cloud service also lets you 
get your apps on your PC. So now on my HTC One X smartphone, again, I have a bunch of apps that I've downloaded, installed, games I play. And the BlueStacks cloud service lets me view all the apps that I have on my phone right here on my PC. And I can jump into any app and launch it. And if I click the app, it's going to play in the BlueStacks app player, which is already on this device. So this is a, a really cool cloud service from BlueStacks. You'll hear more about this in the months to come, weeks to come. And uh, hopefully, you'll get your hands on this, and all of you will, will love using it. Now, that's not it, though. There's, there's one more thing which I think you will really, really enjoy. Uh, takes a few seconds here to set it up. So while he's setting it up, the key here is you know, you got your apps, you got your data. SMS was just a, you know example of the data. And now he's going to show you how we can bring all the sensors on your phone to all the other devices in your house also. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Thanks, Rosen. So um, all of us have our favorite racing app or racing game. And we love playing those games on these phone devices, on our tablets. Now, most of the new mobile devices have built-in sensors, accelerometers, tilt sensors. And that is what really enables you to enjoy these games and, and have real input, real-time input. But what do you do if you are on a PC or a TV that's a, a stationary device and does not have these sensors built in? So we came up with something really neat. Uh, with this new service with this new product that BlueStacks will be launching very soon, you can pair your smartphone with your PC or Mac or your TV. And the phone then lends the sensors over to the stationary device, your PC or TV. So you, you can then enjoy the games that you were enjoying on your phone. You can do that directly using your PC or your TV. So I'm going to try and do that for you here. OK, so this is Final Freeway. It's one of my favorite retro racing games. And as you can see, I am controlling this game, which is running on my PC. I'm controlling it entirely with my smartphone. So my HTC One X is essentially acting as a remote game controller and allowing me to enjoy this racing game on my PC. Now, you could do this on a 50, 60, 80-inch TV. And you can imagine the possibilities this opens up. So this essentially is the future of gaming, not the crash, but what you just saw here. <laughs> he does drive better than the other one. <laughs> so there you go. I hope you enjoyed these demos. And a shout out to uh, the BlueStacks team that's sitting right there. Fantastic. Very Fantastic good. Thank stuff. you. Thanks, Rappu. Now, Blue St you can download BlueStacks now. Uh, a, a big part of what you see here today is actually available. This new connection to the, uh, fo to the phone is something that they're working on, and it'll be out, what, in the next couple months? Okay. Um, I want to jump over to Brian Cho. Br I'm, I'm very pleased that Brian was able to um, join us. Brian is a partner at Andreessen Horowitz, a former Ubisoft exec, and he is responsible for researching out the gaming video sector of what Andreessen Horowitz will invent, invest in. And so I asked, I talked to him the other day and I asked Brian to consider a couple of key questions that I'd like him to focus on. The first one is, what is the state of the gaming industry in terms of new and innovative technology and products? Yeah, um, thanks Tim. So in terms of the gaming industry, if you look back even 20 years, 30 years, there hasn't been a lot of innovation that's happened. And I think it's due to the uh, the publishers that were essentially gate holders to retail. So as a developer, it was very difficult for me to build a game, go to market, unless I was working with the Ubisoft and the EAs of the world in the past. And what's fundamentally has changed is that um, now as a developer, I can essentially go directly to market. And I think what's really uh, helped shape that is platforms like Facebook, iOS, and Android. And I think this is really um, shaping the industry and creating new innovations. And it's great for the consumer as well as the developer community, because now I have a way to go directly to the market. 
And I think as a result of that, you're seeing great technologies like today, you know, the things you guys are demoing today, I think is a result of what's happening to the industry. This evolution from a, a very closed off industry where you had to typically work with these gatekeepers to now you can go direct to the consumers and innovate. Are there, are there any disruptive technologies that you see in the works that could potentially really change things going forward? Um, I think, you know, similar to a lot of things that's happening in software, mobile and cloud, there's no question that's the future of gaming. In terms of specifically disruptive technologies, um, what I really like is the idea that the big uh, glass, the 56 inch screen is actually the second display. So traditionally people thought of um, the, the display as the primary display and the tablet as the second screen. But what we're seeing today is things like BlueStack is allowing you to basically beam up the content that you have on your mobile phone and tablet to the TV. And I think that's a really much, that's a game changer in terms of the game industry because now you don't have to go buy a console anymore. You're not restricted to these big devices that you'd have to typically pay for. Now you can uh, you know, access contact directly from your um, mobile devices, your phone, your tablet, and I think that's a good big change. And number two, uh, another trend that we're seeing is that tablets are actually replacing a lot of these um, heavy consoles. I mean, if you ask a kid today, you know, what would you like for Christmas? Was it gonna be an iPad mini or a PS3? Um, you know, I would like to probably bet that a lot of people would say that they would prefer the iPad or these tablet mobile devices. So I think the consumer behavior is really changing what's happening. And as a result, you're going to see a lot of innovation through tablets, a lot of innovation through um, the second display, which is essentially the large screen becoming the output. So there's one other gaming model that's kind of uh, 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 developed. And it's not really taken off, but it's an interesting scenario mm -hmm. where the game itself is coming directly from the cloud. And NVIDIA has been championing this, where you actually put the GPU in the server in the cloud. Yep. So that you've got the capability of playing a game on any device that's the equivalent of a high quality game because all the processing is done, you know, in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Is that of, you know, and, and one of the companies that was leading this was on live who, you know, didn't, didn't survive. Were they just too early? Is this a real trend? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a real trend. I think the bottleneck there was that, one, the, you know, as you know, the server cost, the infrastructure wasn't ready. But more so, I think on the consumer side, if you ask hardcore gamers, people that were loyal to OnLive or these um, console-like games, even a one or two FPS degradation means that they'd rather play it on the console. And I think unless you're getting this perfect experience as a hardcore gamer, it's really hard for them to sway, to play, um, you know, an inferior experience on the cloud. But that being said, I think quickly it's going to be, you know, within the next few years, you're going to see cloud gaming become more mainstream. You're already seeing that with, um, you know, PlayStation's. They've, inv they've invested uh, a recently and acquired a company that's, you know, doing more cloud gaming. And if you look at a lot of their recent hardware, like the Vita and, you know, hopefully the PS4, I think you're going to see a lot of the themes around cloud with the traditional game developers as well. Very good. So, Casper, I need to come back to you real quickly. Um, one of the things that I want the audience to really understand is what triggers that AR experience? What is it that you're doing, not, not, not only on, the, C, on the, the, the mobile device, but there's a trigger point that when you go to that, when you go to the um, a poster or the book, what is on the book that actually triggers the application? Well, it's actually a um, markerless um, technology. So what, uh, the, what the text looking for in an image, um, take this happy feet poster again, um, it's what we call a spread of corners around the image. Um, and there's about sort of 60 odd um, across it. It's then looking for a degree of contrast in terms of light and shade within that, and also some rotational asymmetry um, so it can detect where it is in relation to the image. So it's, it's sort of markless in that sense. So it's, it, we're, we're asking it to look for those points of interest and therefore trigger the experience and make it stay on there. Um, there is a sense that you know, maybe markless is slightly emperor's new clothes, because unless you've still got a brand device on there that says this is AR enabled, you'd never know that you were meant to do anything with it. Um, that's how it works. So in your, now let's, let's, I see that in here, but in the context of what it's looking for on, let's say, the hat, is it yep. the same thing? You're just, it's identifying the image and then 
that's the trigger point. It's exactly the same principle, yeah. You know, uh, same things, uh, spread of corners, a uh, good amount of contrast in that. Uh, we have to think slightly differently because it is a curved surface um, and therefore where someone is relative to that. Um, but that's, you know, the nice thing about having, you know, these, these clever guys um, as part of the founders of the business is they've got quite a hacker's mentality to it. So we can, we can really uh, manipulate the, the algorithm and the, and the platform in order to deal with that. Very good. Now, they can download the Zapper app now, because I know it's Indeed. available on the iPhone and Android. And Android as well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's true. And Casper brought uh, about 100 cards here that actually have trigger points. So if you want to test them, come up yeah. afterwards and, and grab them. But you can also go to the Zapper, uh, Z-A-P-P-A-R dot com site and get this kind of information as well. And Jim, I want to come back to you on the, the display issue. Um, in, in our research for many years, in our early stages of research, when we were looking at the future of screens, we, we looked at it in the context that our, the major screens in our life would probably be the PC, the TV, and the, and the um, cell phone. Uh, now, we're having to look at it and say, oh wait, we also have the tablets. Oh yeah, wait, we also might have the refrigerator. All of a sudden, these screens are popping up everywhere. From your standpoint, you guys, of course, have always been somewhat PC-centric because of what you've done with the Gorilla Glass on portables. But how are you enabling and thinking about other screens that eventually will impact what we do, including not only what might be embedded, but also flexible? Yeah. Well, um, clearly, the more screens, the better for us, right? The more screens, the more glass, and, and Corning is very happy. Uh, so everything we do is essentially enabling um, form factors, uh, such as uh, thinner displays, or as you pointed out, flexible displays. Now honestly, the way I think about a flexible display, it sounds intriguing. It's an intriguing thing to, you know, to bend the display and maybe roll it up and stick it in your pocket, right? But in the end, do you really want your display to bend and roll up in your pocket, <laughs> right? I, so I, the, way, the way I think of flexible is I think about it more in terms of conformable. Right, so as, as the electron, and don't forget the electronics have to become flexible too, right? It's not just the glass. It's the electronics, um, in, in the case of LCD, you've got a rigid backlight that creates problems, right? So bending, I don't think so, but conforming, I think those problems can be solved, right? So, so what you saw uh, during my presentation where you have this wraparound um, sort of view of the world, right? We think that's, that's in our near-term future. Right? So it, whatever it is, right, as long as it's glass, right, it's good for us. And then some of the things we're doing to enable those better form factors, those more natural form factors, right, will be, will be a focus for us going forward. Okay. Uh, now, if you have an Android device, I would encourage you to down, down, uh, download the BlueStacks app. And that will immediately, you, you're downloading it on your phone as well as your PC, is that right? And then what happens when I do that? Well, the first thing that happens is your children will think you're cool again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you heard that, but he said that uh, the first thing that will happen is that your kids will think you're cool. <laughs> and the, then you can enjoy all your apps and your data and you know. I mean, basically our lives, our phones know more about us than our spouses do, right? And so now your other devices can know all that information, which is That's a scary and, thought. <laughs> <laughs> they know where you ate, Tim. You were not supposed to eat that food. <laughs> yeah, the, the bigger issue is if it was transmitting that data to my wife, then I'd have an issue. Um, Brian, um, are there any companies that you're looking at right now? Uh, I know you can't talk about who you're going to invest in, but companies that are really intriguing you that uh, get your attention and interest. Um, at a macro level, I, I think what's interesting today is these open source consoles. So you're seeing a lot of the rise of um, consoles today that are powered by Android, for instance. So again, no longer you're powered by the Sonys, the Microsofts, the Nintendos of the world. You have this open source console that allows developers to build uh, new content, new technologies on top of. So I think that's a very interesting trend. But going back to that theory of the big display becoming the second, the big screen becoming the second display, I think you're going to see a shift where a lot of these consoles are going to be replaced by mobile phones. So if you have a controller now that interacts with your you know, Galaxy or your iPhone 5, 
now you don't have a need to buy a separate console device. So I think in terms of the trend that we're seeing, this open source console allowing developers to create very focused content for gamers specifically, I think that's a very interesting trend. OK. Last question to you, you Casper, is what are the commerce implications for something like uh, augmented reality? Well, I think that's been the nut that everyone's been trying to crack, actually. I think, in a way, if the, if the jury's been out on augmented reality to date, it's been, well, what is that, um, you know, what is, what is the business model? Um, and for us, uh, because of, I guess, the way we think about the world in terms of AR-enabled products, um, it's about giving consumers added value, but also then taking existing content and repurposing and getting it out there in a different way. So, so I guess we, can, we derive revenue from sales of physical goods, um, uh, as well as then doing specific projects, you know, for, for, for different kind of brand engagements. So, uh, and, and, and I think as I said in my talk, it's, it's quite scalable once you've done that with some of the licenses that tend to be universal in different markets. Um, so if we do a, a, a Skylanders t-shirt here in the US, it's as applicable, you know, in Europe and South America and South Africa uh, and everywhere else in the world. Very good. So when I started the session this morning, I mentioned uh, that uh, I co-founded with my son a new technology uh, uh, site called Tech Pinions, T E C H P I N I O N S, and in it, in my column yesterday, I did a synopsis of what we discussed today, and you you want to use that as a reference point to look deeper into what these guys are doing. Let me thank each of you for joining us today. It's been fascinating. Um, these are just three of the disruptive technologies that I've seen in the last year that will impact us in the next uh, 6 to 12 to 18 months. And I really encourage you to download the BlueStacks and start, if you've got an Android device, start playing with it. The fact, it, what, what you'll start seeing is the, the, the conceptual idea of being able to have an app, your app, on any one of your screens. And that's where they're leading the charge. And look, obviously, go by the Corning booth and uh, if you, like I said, download the Zapper app on your iPhone or Android phone or pick up one of these cards that will give you the trigger point. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Have a good show.